I'm going to be talking about here is basically some research that we've been doing around children's ability to deal with password information and other secrets that they might use in order to authenticate themselves to the systems and services that they use. So, basically, as we all, we're all aware, various online services require us to remember some sort of login credentials in order to be able to get access under our account. And indeed, passwords themselves are essentially the de facto approach that's used everywhere across the internet, and indeed people are now encountering them from a very early age, and certainly their children are exposed to them within schools. I think also what we can probably relate to from our own perhaps personal experiences and things that we've heard that other people do, is that picking passwords is not necessarily a natural skill. You hear quite a lot about how people choose poor passwords, how passwords are crackable, guessed, etc. And so Certainly, they can be difficult for some users to use, and they can be difficult for some users to remember. And we were wondering whether this might be a particular issue amongst the younger generation when they're first introduced to this technology, and also what lessons do they learn, or what behaviours do they acquire as part of this early exposure. So in terms of password weaknesses, well, there are several established ones. We're not very good at selecting them. We're not very good at managing them. And the passwords themselves and the mechanism can be vulnerable to attack and misuse. So, one thing that we considered as part of this study is, is there an alternative method that we can use that is perhaps a more suitable or, in some context, a better method, but retaining the secret knowledge aspect as the core of the approach? Of course, there's other authentication techniques that we're aware of that exist, so you've got token-based approaches, various biometric technologies, but all of those impose some sort of overhead on the user and, of course, on the organisation that's running them, in terms, not, not least of which, of course, the cost. Because the biometrics typically require some sort of reader device and tokens require you to issue tokens and you've got issue of people losing them. So can we do something else that sticks around the issue of secrets? Now in terms of passwords, um, given the time I won't do an ask the audience, but there are various problems here and I wonder if people can sort of relate to some of these. So I mentioned badly selected and thereby potentially easily guessed or easily cracked by other people. So they can be too short, not enough characters within them, not enough diversity of characters to ensure that they're resilient against a brute force password cracking bit of software, because that's the way that quite a lot of this actually occurs. Dictionary words, again, because of the way that password cracking tools, auditing tools work, they know about the dictionary words already, and although the password might be captured in an encrypted form, well, the tool knows the encrypted dictionary words anyway. And in terms of attacks by other people, Having things based on our personal data that other people might know about us could make it easier for them to guess our passwords, to guess their way into our accounts. And then things which, of course, people don't do, like writing their passwords down, never changing them, of course. We all change our passwords on a regular basis on the sensitive systems that we use. And, of course, we use different passwords on all the systems that we use. Or perhaps we don't. And therein lies some of the problem. So, certainly, if your password is cracked on one account and you've used same password on a number of other systems, then you've effectively put all your eggs in one basket. So in terms of alternatives, one of the things that we've, we've considered as part of this research is the use of image-based information. So seeing whether the children in the study could remember a sequence of pictures rather than having to remember this textual information. So without going into detail here, there's some long-standing research here, actually by just standing it out, uh, dating back to 1970, that talks about people's ability to recall and recognize images. In this particular case, even if they've only seen them for a short time. So in terms of the way that people's memories work, image-based information is quite good in this context. And uh, so what we're looking at here is methods that present images are things that enable recognition rather than a precise recall, which is, of course, what you need if you're using passwords. You can't just have a look at the screen and get some sort of prompt from it when you're using a password. You've got to remember that exact information. Okay, so drawing upon people's ability to recognize from a set of images that are in front of them is potentially going to pay some dividends. Now, there are various graphical alternatives for authentication. The one we're going to draw upon here is remembering a sequence of images. And there's various other bits of research work that have operated in this space up to now. So um, you can Google these various keywords that I've emphasized in italics there to find out more detail of those studies. It's not the only way you can use 
image-based or graphical authentication. You can also have things where people remember something about an image, so they can be remembering secret points within it, for example, or in some cases requiring the user to draw an image of uh, their secret. But in terms of the ease of implementation and the applicability to different scenarios, this remembering a sequence is possibly one of the better ones. So in terms of our study, um, it was a joint bit of work between Plymouth University and the South Wales Group for Learning. What we were interested in was, okay, how do children go about constructing their traditional passwords and how would they cope with an alternative method? So do they find this something that would actually be usable? So we designed an experimental website-based approach um, within our Centre for Security, Communications and Network Research. And this was then utilised in a number of schools with a number of children. And the study itself was administered by Dr. Shirley Atkinson from Plymouth University and Laura Pierce from the South West Grid. A total up to now, because some of the work is still ongoing, of 290 children have taken part at various key stages there. So you can see different sample populations within the different age groups. And what each of them was required to do was register with the site and to choose their associated secret, and then they would be logging into that site and seeing what their experience of actually using the service on an ongoing basis was. Now when they logged in, the system would assign them to either the text password group or the image authentication group. So as the participants, they didn't have a choice of which approach they'd use, they were system assigned into roughly equal sample sizes. In terms of the registration, this is what it looked like for those choosing text-based passwords. So, to make the process at least consistent in terms of the, the way in which selections were done, they were required to choose their password and make the letter entries via the mouse, pointing at the, uh, at the characters here. <coughs> now you'll notice compared to normal passwords that we're able to use, where we've got the character sets including numerics and special symbols, here it's a fairly restricted character set of just alphabetic. Um, but nonetheless, this was considered suitable to the age group we were considering. In terms of the image approach, they had a rather more graphically rich display there, and they were asked to choose three images as the basis for their, their secret sequence. Now the images that we chose, as you can see there, they're photographic images, and what we aimed to do within each of these was select, or to have a sequence of images, we had a, a bank over about 30, uh, 39, I think was the, the number that we built into the system to choose from, and each time somebody registered, they get a random selection from that 39 as they're pulled to register from. But all of the images you can see are discernibly about something. So they're things that the children of the different age groups ought to be able to recognise the subject of the image. So you've got a penguin, a kettle, a flower. So it's something that they could, they could internalise and memorise as part of their, their authentication. So they would select three of them and that was their secret. Then when it came to the login process, um, very similar looking interface from the text password perspective. Now you'll notice here what we weren't doing was part of, if you like, the standard practice you see for normal password login. We weren't masking out the characters that they were using. We weren't interested so much in protecting the secret. We were trying to test their ability to remember it. So in terms of the things you normally see in an authentication system, some of that wasn't there. Um, what it doesn't do, it doesn't indicate the number of characters that they're expected to enter. So um, if somebody was trying to masquerade as somebody else, they at least wouldn't get an upfront clue as to how many characters were involved. In terms of the image-based login, um, again, it's not indicating the sequence length. And what they will have then seen is their secret image distributed, or their secret images, mixed in amongst a sequence of others that were nothing to do with them. And if you uh, were to log in on successive occasions, what you would get is, of course, always your three secret images would be there, but the other ones, the decoy images, if you like, that were surrounding them, they would change, okay? So our overall findings, if we looked across the entire set of results, irrespective of passwords or graphics approaches, 152 attempts involved forgotten login details, so the user went to the thing and had to say, okay, can't remember what my details are, and 1,047 successful logins, and 389 attempts to log in, but actually indicating the wrong information as part of the process. So if we now delve a little bit deeper, we can look at how these split across the text and the image-based approaches and the different age groups. So if we look at uh, Key Stage 1, just as a, a starting point, we had 92 participants, um, or 92 um, in, 
occurrences rather than 92 login attempts involving the text-based passwords, 87 attempts involving the image-based approaches. And what you can see here is that the password-based approach, and you'll see this pattern emerging for the other age groups as well, the password-based approach is generally more successful. Um, a lot more errors, or can be more errors at least, made with the image-based approach than with the password. If we jump on to key stage two, you can see generally they're a lot more successful in remembering their details across both of the, the sets, but passwords even more demonstrably successful there in terms of not having the forgotten, um, not having the login errors and the forgotten information. And key stage three, a little bit better, worse than key stage two, but nonetheless it's still quite successful on the password side. And if we then look at the overall results, so this is the average across the whole set of key stages, you can see a tangible difference in the level of success and you could sort of conclude from that that okay, passwords are a more effective means of authentication or means of getting the youngsters to remember their secrets than the image approach. Okay, that's a possible conclusion. But what was interesting <coughs> is the way in which the passwords were being used. And what we found, and this would then tend to explain how they were a lot more memorable, was perhaps unsurprisingly the, the participants were tending to choose recognisable words and phrases as a basis for their password. So very early on, adopting the sort of behaviours that if we look at the guidelines for password use, all the things that we would encounter if we were given security policies and password guidance by certain websites or by organisations, this is one of the things we were specifically guided not to do. Also, the length of the passwords that were being used were not particularly significant. So we had average length of six characters amongst the older group of children, and the younger ones with an average length of three and a half characters. Okay. Um, so overall, this is how the password lengths distributed amongst the groups. Okay, so one thing that we can draw off that is very early on. The, the participants are actually adopting password practices that we can see as inadvisable in real world use. And just to, to briefly note, even when you go to real world systems, there is no standard practice in this area, and we can't rely upon real world systems to protect us in this regard. So just drawing on some results that we had from a, a different study that we've done, just looking at the extent of password enforcement and guidance on 10 leading websites in the real world, so Facebook, Google, etc. You can see them listed there. What we can see is the lengths that they're enforcing, in some cases at the minimum, it's only six characters, so it's not particularly strong, that's easily crackable. And a lot of other things that you would hope users would be safeguarding against, so use of obvious details as the basis for their password, use of the word password as their password, are not prevented in many of these sites. Just to draw attention to the further development of the image-based approach, we've got um, a grown-ups version, as I've, I've indicated it there. So this is a more involved system where users can choose from a variety of different image themes, so they've got more choice over the pictures they choose. And we've also incorporated the idea of hotspots within images as well, so that they can remember both a combination of images, and a sequence of images, and secret points between them, so balancing the number of images and the number of secret points their preference. <coughs> okay, so from our study with the youngsters, the children achieved a high success rate in remembering their passwords, but they were doing it basically through having chosen passwords that, in general terms, you wouldn't advise them to use. And what it's suggesting is that even from this young age, the sort of password practices that tend to predominate amongst the adult community, and the things that we're always trying to stop the adult audience from doing, those bad practices get established fairly early on. Okay. So passwords are a significant lesson to learn as part of our general online safety and security, but what we've seen is that the bad habits can form very early on, and from the other research, that websites in general won't force you to do it right, so it is a lesson that needs to be learned properly. If you want to play around with passwords yourselves, we've got a password strength meter system that you can use on our research centre website, so there's a URL for that, and there's a free guide that it mentions as part of that, with some do's and don'ts on actually choosing passwords. If you want some further advice, um, pop to that site and get that flyer, which you can download. And with that, um, I will be clearing this over.